my own uh, colleagues and I published our own research. We interviewed um, 92 gestational surrogates in America and took them through a very rigorous peer-reviewed study. And I want to say it's the first of its kind research. You always are kind of cautious because then somebody finds some somebody else has done it. But we have quite a bit of studies in the medical literature that shows that surrogate pregnancies are much higher risk. Um, and much more higher rates of complications to mother and child. And what our, our research did, which was unique, is we took these 92 women and we asked them the same questions for their own pregnancies with their own children and then with the surrogate pregnancies. And we, in our research, mirrored what's already out there uh, about these high-risk surrogate pregnancies when they otherwise had natural pregnancies with that were uncomplicated. And our research showed that they had higher rates of postpartum depression where women who went home with their own children didn't have the high rates of uh, postpartum depression as they did with their surrogate pregnancies, which kind of makes sense when you think about this whole nine month pregnancy and then you go home, you know, with your, your job is done and your children are going, where's the baby? Oh yeah, but your body must think the baby's died. Like that, that, yeah, that, uh, the, the depression makes complete sense. Um, yeah. I didn't know that though about the other, other risks of complications. Do we know why that is? Um, I, I would say a couple things. One is, I mean, if you just, there's plenty in the medical literature about women who use donor eggs for pregnancy. So say you're a 45 year old woman and you want to conceive and you say, well, I'm going to get donor eggs. So there's a lot in the literature that women who do that kind of a scenario to conceive have higher rates of preeclampsia, of maternal hypertension, because it's a foreign egg. You're putting a foreign body in this, in this woman's body. So it's and so not there's even a rejection. Just not even just from being 45 it's no, that plus exactly. she could be a 30 year old woman who for some reason has no ovarian reserve you know she just went through early menopause as a young woman um so it's the same thing the surrogate is pregnant with donor eggs i mean it's a donor embryo you know it's an embryo that's made from donor eggs so her body immediately sees this as a foreign um you know, object in her body. Um, there are also higher rates of complications because it's not uncommon for a surrogate to be asked to um, carry, you know, twins or triplets, which automatically confer a higher risk pregnancy because of that. But it just even in our research and other medical um, publications, even women carrying a single birth, singleton, as a surrogate, as a gestational surrogate, will have these complications. Now, they often can be managed. Um, but, you know, and then it gets into asking questions, but should we even be putting otherwise healthy women who should be home tending to their own children in these kind of high risk situations, especially when we're offering the money? I mean, the whole money layer. Um, and that's one of the, the debates happening in the United Kingdom right now is on the, you know, the reimbursement and what can surrogates be be paid, even though your model in the United Kingdom is an altruistic model, there's still a lot of money that surrogates make because they're reimbursed for expenses. And, and what are expenses? Rent, I have to have a place to live. I have to have food to eat. I have to have clothes to wear. Mm. I think that the Law Commission have explicitly advised against offering money for, say, rent. But have you, as you say, it, it's as long as a piece of string, what reimbursement looks like so it's very easy to actually pass money under the table is is another risk to surrogates also the fact that there's clearly an incentive to um the space births closely if you're making money and if you're having c-sections you know i i when i had a c-section i was advised to wait at least 18 months before getting pregnant again um but yeah. i guess if you need the money you might not do that and that must increase the risks as well yeah, there there is the risk that you know overwhelmingly surrogates are higher rates of C-section, and that could be because they're already in high rates. You know, one of the women I interviewed in one of my documentary films, you know, she had severe preeclampsia. I mean, she was on the border of having a stroke because her blood pressure was so high, and she was you know very premature, and so she had to have an emergency C-section. So there's there's C-section that just comes with the, the complications of the pregnancy. Sometimes there's C-sections because it's convenience. The intended parents are in town. Your due date has come. We've traveled from Spain. You know we want to get back home. You're you're you know you're past your due date. Let's have a C-section. You know because it's it's sort of convenience. Um, then there's the dreaded Druitt Barlow's that you know our famous couple in um, 
I guess they're no longer a couple, but they were for many years a couple. And um, and I think one of them was bold enough to say on camera that they wanted their surrogates to have C-section because they didn't want their children to touch a dirty vagina. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so this that whole layer of you know hatred towards women or you know treating us as you know chattel. Um, it's it's so there's you know it's and I look at the United States. I, I'm sorry I'm not up to speed on. Um, you know, your maternal health and morbidity rates. But, you know, the United States is such a wealthy, wealthy country. We still have horrible data as it relates to women, you know, pregnant mothers and in complications and even death. So, but, you know, I think we've had six or seven U.S. surrogates that have died that we know about. And mm-hmm. the tragedy is the only reason we even find out that these women die is almost always because somebody sets up a GoFundMe. And you'll see a GoFundMe that's been set up for the surrogate who died and we're trying to raise money for the grieving husband or the, the children that lost their mother. You know, the most recent one was a Jane Doe. They wouldn't publish her name, but she was a single mom with, uh, th- I think, three children, two or three children. So the GoFundMe was set up for these children that, you know, were you know basically orphaned. And it was funny because the surrogate agency was called Family Makers. <laughs> and I'm like, no, yeah. they're orphan makers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I presume as well that there are other, um, there are lots of other objections that one can make to the surrogacy industry aside from safety. Um, which to your mind are the most pressing objections? You've, you've said that you, it's not a matter of just regulating it and, and giving surrogates more rights. You really think that the whole industry actually um, needs to be done away with. Yeah, I mean, I when I talk to people, I always say there's plenty about surrogacy for everyone to find something to dislike about it. You know, whether you are, you know, I'm a big, you know, I was a pediatric critical care nurse for many, many years. So I'm a big supporter and champion of maternal child bonding. Um, and maternal child bonding happens in utero. It doesn't happen magically. Once you bring the baby home, then you all bond. You know, we know um, that babies bond with their mother in the womb. Um, and that connection is is a good connection. And then in surrogacy arrangements, we just sort of magically want to say, well, it doesn't matter over here. Well, nobody's asked the baby. And we know just from adoption research that there's a lot of trauma in separating birth mothers and, and children, even though we know adoption has to happen sometimes because people can't, for m- many reasons, can't care for their children. Um, women aren't doing this for free. I mean, we saw that on full display in New York City, New York State, which recently legalized commercial surrogacy because after the baby M case, no commercial surrogacy was allowed. Only the altruistic model was allowed. And the the key signer, the senator of New York, who is a gay man who has a husband, complained that he and his husband had to come to California twice to pay women to be surrogates so that they could have children. And it was a supply and demand issue. He said, women are not willing to do this for free. And yes, most women are not willing to carry a nine month pregnancy um, just because they're a nice person. Unlike organ donation, where people will altruistically donate a kidney or you know, some kind of a tissue or blood. So, you know, between the health risks, the maternal child bonding, the the disregard for the baby, the commercial aspect of it, um, I always read surrogate contracts when surrogate women contact me if they get into trouble or have complications, you know, to read a contract that these women sign. Most of them are 60, 70, 80 pages long, which most women, if you're not savvy, you know, how can you slog through that long of a contract and really understand what all this means? And the attorney that is executing the contract represents the purchasing side of the equation. So they're not the they're not the lawyer who's re, who's representing the surrogate and making sure that she's protected. And you know, contracts always have um, termination clauses where um, the language is very. If the intended parents just want you to terminate the pregnancy, you must terminate the pregnancy doesn't have to say because life of the mother or life of the child, just because we've changed our mind or we're getting a divorce. Now there was one surrogate, the couple decided to divorce while she was pregnant. And so they wanted her to terminate um, the pregnancy. Um, they always have reduction clauses. So it, you know, two women in California were pregnant with triplets and the, the intended parents wanted them to reduce down the pregnancy because they didn't want three babies. Um, they have everything from what you can eat, what you can drink, if you can dye your hair, 
you know, one woman, her contract required her to eat a vegan diet for nine months because the parents that hired her wanted her to eat a vegan diet. Um, one woman signed away her end of life decision making. So mm -hmm. if she was in an accident during the pregnancy, the intended parents who she'd never met, they didn't know her, had authority to make end of life decision to withdraw life support or leave her on life support. You know, it's just. Is that, I mean, is that legal for them to? to... It's not illegal. Mm. You know, um, it's not right. <laughs> but, you know, when there's no law against it. And that's what, one thing that they say about California being the exemplar, you know, sort of the poster child for how to do it. We have these ironclad contracts. We have all this regulation. But it doesn't protect the women. And it certainly doesn't protect the children. One, you know, we have the Chinese come in droves to California because all surrogacy is illegal in China. You cannot buy eggs in China. The Chinese are very, very wealthy. And one whistleblower contacted me um, and she was over the VIP clients for the San Diego agency, which meant she handled all the Chinese because they were the VIP. They come with buckets of money. And she said, it's not uncommon for the Chinese to get three women pregnant at the same time. And then once the pregnancies are all confirmed and ultrasounds say twins or single or boys or girls, then they'll ask two of the three surrogates to terminate. Wow. Because there's it's it's really high failure rate. IVF has a very high failure rate. So they're just trying to get, you know, expedite the getting the baby. Well, let's get three women pregnant and then we'll see what happens. And hopefully, you know, we'll get a baby that we can take back to China. Mm. The argument that you'll often hear from people who um, maybe they're a little bit squeamish about the surrogacy, but um, they don't want to be completely anti. They'll say, look, I don't like the idea of sort of Indian baby farms where you've got really poor women basically imprisoned and, and, and all of this. You know, I don't like that. Clearly, there is an issue with, you know, if you have any objections to people buying and selling kidneys, then you really ought to have objections to people buying and selling babies and 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 the use of women's wombs, you know, fine. But people will say, what about altruistic arrangements? You know, what about if it's a sister, what about, you know, you can't, you can't just uh, oppose the sort of organic free range version of surrogacy just because there's a, there's a, there's a bad side to it. Do you find that argument convincing at all? Yeah, I get that a lot. Why can't a sister help her sister, or your best friend, you know, so give your sister some of your eggs or, or have a baby for her. Um, you know, that doesn't whisk away the health complications. It doesn't risk away the, the risk to, you know, so you want to risk your sister's health or your best friend's health. Um, it doesn't take away from the fact that this baby has grown in this woman's womb and then is, you know, traumatized by being separated. Uh, I have interviewed many people that have done that, you know, not, they were not paid. You know, one woman in one of my films, she was the surrogate for her, her gay brother and his partner. Um, she was the gestational surrogate because she they didn't use her egg because it did, would be too incestuous, you know, to have her brother's sperm in her egg. Um, and she wasn't paid, you know, because she was helping her brother. And she gave birth to twins. One, she almost died. She it was very high risk, complicated pregnancy. She delivered prematurely, so the you know the babies were very fragile and in the NICU, neonatal ICU for many many months, so they could be sent home. And she and her brother don't even speak. You know, so the whole dynamics of the family have just broken down. Um, you know, my book <clears throat> with Renata Klein and um, Melinda Tankard Rice out of Spin Effects is called Broken Bonds of Surrogate Mothers Speak Out. And there's quite a few stories in there of women who were surrogates for friends or family members. And, you know, it's it, it's, you know, it's just a broken relationship. It's shattered. And part of it is just human nature and the jealousy you know, this woman was able to provide a child for me and I wasn't able to do it, you know, and there's, there's sort of a jealousy. Um, there's a resentment. There's a, well, we've got what we've got now. Can you just please go away? Um, which is why a lot of people want these contracts and they just hire a woman that they don't really intend to have any kind of relationship with because it just muddies the, muddies the arrangement. So, you know, yeah. Do you want to ask your friend or your sister to do something that might end up, you know, causing her to lose her life or, having your relationships forever damaged and fractured, you know, not to say that it always happens, but it's, you know, it's like anything else. We don't tell people go ahead and smoke because most smokers don't get lung cancer. 
you know, we say don't smoke because you might get it. And it really is awful if you get it. Um, so it's like, you know, maybe this arrangement with your family and your sister will work out well and no complications, no health complications. Everybody will be all lovey-dovey together afterwards. But do you want to take that risk um, and have to live with the consequences of that for the rest of your life? And what do we want the state to condone as well? Because part of what government policy says is, is this is the model we think you should be following. And if at the moment, I mean, what we're doing in the UK and what seems to be happening all over the place is a push towards greater and greater um, yeah. liberalism on the on on surrogacy, you know, implicitly saying this is good. We want our citizens to be doing this. And as yeah. you say, there are just so many, so many negative outcomes for for surrogate mothers and to and to the babies. So we know, don't we, that the we can measure the stress in newborns who are taken away from the women who've just given birth to them. Um, do we know anything about what kind of long-term consequences are that there are for the children of these arrangements? This is a moving target because, as, you know, assisted reproductive technology is still relatively new technology. And in order to have good data, you need, you know, large sample size and you need to follow the subjects of the study over time, um, which is why we're just now starting to get studies out on surrogate pregnancies and the complications that we're seeing in there, because we're doing it more regularly now since the baby N kind of case. And, you know, we're, you know, we, we're three decades out and we've got a lot more women that we can now, you know, gather data. The same is true of children that are born through assisted reproductive technologies. And this is just in general, like even if you and your husband or your partner, you know, do IVF with your own egg and your own sperm, but you use assisted reproductive technology, um, we're seeing now that the children born of these technologies, whether it be surrogacy or just egg donation or a regular old husband and wife, um, we're seeing that the, the children of these uh, arrangements, these high tech pregnancies are having complications. And it's it's an evolving story, um, again, because we're following and looking and gathering more data. Um, but because these children are often born um, prematurely, and they're often born when, when you're premature, you're low birth weight. So all the complications that come with prematurity and low birth weight, which are immediate short-term complications, and they're also can be complications, you know, down the road based on the fact that you were born really tiny as a preemie. Um, there's stuff in the literature about children having certain, uh, being at higher risk for certain genetic diseases. Uh, two of the one, the genetic diseases that I've seen reported are, you know, Beck with Wedemann syndrome and um, Angelman syndrome. So it's just kind of like, hmm, I wonder why this is. There was something that came out in my inbox last week. It was a new study that showed um, we it 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 was comparing lesbian couples who are just using sperm donation. You know, lesbian couples need a sperm. They usually have the egg and they usually have the womb. Um, but they were showing that lesbian couples. To having children through sperm donation, which is kind of low tech. You can just do artificial insemination. You don't have to do IVF. Um, have lower, these children have lower rates of these complications than the children that are made through IVF. Um, and this, this study was actually raising a question I've been wondering about for a long time. Is it the technique, the actual technique of making these little embryos in the lab and then transferring them? Or is it the fact, here's a couple that otherwise couldn't conceive and we've ignored the fact that um, mother nature or evolution or whatever, that there's some, you know, fertility flaw in this couple for some reason, they, and that we've forced them to have children. So, you know, again, we're, you know, we're experimenting on these children. They're the subjects of this human experiment, you know, that we're just doing without their permission. Um, and I, I just often wonder, I often wonder about the complications of egg donors. You know, and my colleagues and I did a, one uh, publication in a journal, and it was just a case report of five otherwise healthy young women who got breast cancer as very young women. And um, the one thing they had in common is they were all donor, egg donors. So they'd taken, you know, high dose fertility drugs to donate their eggs. And we know that egg donors are heavily screened out for history of cancer. Nobody's going to buy a woman's egg who checks, yes, I have a history of cancer. Yes, I have a history of breast cancer. So what was, was, you know, huh, curious to us. Why would these women who are otherwise healthy develop a breast cancer that doesn't affect your usually young women? You know, it's a breast cancer that affects women 40s and 50s and 60s. 
Um, so I just wonder how many women out there now who have some kind of a breast or reproductive ovarian cancer, you know, were, have a history of surrogacy, egg donation, or even IVF on their own, taking fertility drugs on their own. There's so much unknown, um, which as a nurse really troubles me because of the issue of informed consent and the collusion of informed consent in the case of third party with money.